Good evening from Asia, good evening, everyone. Asia, everyone. And welcome to this webinar on the eve of CITES' 50th birthday and the 10th anniversary of World Wildlife Day. My name is Sophie Leclou, CEO of ADM Capital Foundation, and we're delighted to be today's host. In commemorating these events, we're taking this opportunity, along with our colleagues from the Association of Zoos and Aquarium, Born Free Foundation, China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation, the International Conservation Caucus Foundation, IUCN Wild, IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, Impala, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Wildlife Conservation Society, and the Wildlife Trust of India. We're hoping to present an engaging event focusing on the important role and deep involvement played by civil society with CITES over the past 50 years. From international NGOs to grassroots organizations and community groups living along wildlife itself, civil society has played an important role in many, dis many different aspects of CITES work. Indeed, engagement and partnerships with civil society have increasingly been at the core of CITES success. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from passionate individuals, from organisations that have worked tirelessly with CITES over many years, liaising with the parties and the secretariat on a wide range of issues and topics. From listing proposals to NDFs, conservation policy, combating illegal trade, contributing to the science that underpins the Convention's decisions, and providing in-situ perspectives that have guided much of CITES' work and its evolution. We'll also hear from individuals that have served with the CITES Secretariat itself, who will share some of their personal reflections. And we'll be guided through our agenda by John Scanlon AO, who, as I'm sure many of you know, was at the helm of CITES as Secretary General from 2010 to 2018. John served as Secretary General at a time when there was a significant increase in the level of political attention, public profile, funding, partnerships and outreach of CITES. He played a leading role in 3rd of March being declared as UN World Wildlife Day, and in helping to see it become the largest annual global celebration of wildlife. We're delighted that John has agreed to moderate today's event. So John, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Sophie. And uh, thanks for your generous introduction. And a big thank you to the ADM Capital Foundation for hosting today's celebratory event. Like you, Sophie, we are most grateful to our extraordinary lineup of expert speakers, all of our wonderful co-sponsoring organizations, and I'm sure it's gonna be a really interesting discussion that we have today. Tomorrow, 3rd March, it's gonna be the 50th anniversary of CITES uh, being signed in Washington, DC. And since 2014, the 3rd of March has been celebrated as UN World Wildlife Day. Now, over the past 50 years, CITES has gathered a deeply committed, knowledgeable and diverse array of observers who actively and passionately engage with the convention. And they've been active players in the creation evolution and implementation of the convention, as we are about to hear. Now, 50 years on, uh, CITES still has many imperfections. There remain serious gaps with national legislation, scientific capacity, reporting enforcement, and with the paper permitting system. But notwithstanding, after 50 years, we can say that CITES efforts to ensure legal and sustainable wildlife trade, while still imperfect, has benefited thousands of species of wild animals and plants threatened by illegal, unregulated and unsustainable trade. And civil society has played an important role in achieving these successes. The convention text in its preamble recognizes that peoples and states are and should be the best protectors of their own wild fauna and flora. And it makes specific provision for observers to be represented at meetings of the Conference of the Parties including non-governmental bodies. Now the convention text left the specifics of how to involve uh, observers in CITES processes up to the parties. The convention's practice and procedures have evolved over the past 50 years to enable increasing levels of involvement of civil society in its decision-making and implementation, which remains a work in progress as we saw at COP19. Today, we're going to discuss how engaging with civil society has involved striking a delicate balance between its involvement in decision-making and implementation while preserving the preeminent role of states parties to the convention. Now, this evolution has not been without controversy, tension or widely diverging points of view. And during my time as secretary general, I heard anything from high praise to assertions of undue influence. However, whatever perspective one has, the active engagement of civil society has overall been a key part of the success of the convention. And today with all of its imperfections, we meet to celebrate 
the role that civil society has played in making CITES what it is today. And in doing so, we're going to dive into the past, the present, and the future. Now, we are going to hear from an extraordinary group of engaging speakers who are going to regale us with their stories about CITES and civil society. And we're going to start with some scene setting speeches and then move to two open panel discussions, after which we're going to bring everyone together for some reflections on what the next 50 years might look like. Now, you can ask questions via the Q&A box, not the chat box, please. And we're going to endeavor to answer them in writing as we go and to see if we can build some of them into the panel discussions. And just a reminder, we are recording today's event and we'll be sharing it online. Now, finally, I, I just want to warn you right from the outset that I'm just off an overnight flight from Washington, D.C., and there's been no dress rehearsal for today's event. It's going to be quite impromptu, quite possibly a little chaotic at times, but we hope it will always be informative, thought-provoking, and maybe even a little entertaining. Now, with that, we are delighted to welcome the first speaker for this opening session, Dr. Rosemary Nam. She's the head of the Division of the Scientific Authority with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Rosemary now also serves since COP19 as the chair of the CITES Standing Committee. So with that, Rosemary, over to you to make some welcoming remarks. Thank you, John. I'd like to warmly welcome everyone to the CITES and the role of civil society webinar. As evident by the number of webinar registrants, this is an important topic and contributes greatly to transparency and engagement by all stakeholders in the conservation of animals and plants that are in international trade. We often hear in CITES circles that it takes a village to ensure that CITES is functioning effectively and civil society is a much needed member of this village. Civil society, including non-governmental organizations, industry, researchers, provides an important vo voice in CITES discussions. These voices provide critical information regarding species, trade trends and routes, and the perspectives of the public, which will all help to inform CITES discussions and parties' decision-making. While such engagement can often yield divergent views and information, the CITES parties have agreed that it's important to provide a forum for all stakeholders to make meaningful contributions. The United States is committed to ensuring transparency and public engagement in our preparations for CITES meetings, and in particular meetings of the Conference of the Parties. Through a series of federal register notices, the United States seeks public input in determining what documents, including proposals to amend the CITES appendices, the United States should submit to a COP and developing US positions on other party submissions. Observer organizations defined as intergovernmental, international or national government or non-governmental bodies, technically qualified in protection, conservation or management of wild fauna and flora are invited to participate in the discussions at CITES meetings and participate actively in working groups and the inter intersessional work of the CITES committees, including the standing committee. While civil society input is important in informing CITES decision making, the ultimate decisions are taken by the CITES parties. This robust civil society engagement emphasizes the importance that CITES parties place on ensuring vigorous discussions and thoughtful decision making. Today, we are fortunate to hear from our distinguished webinar speakers firsthand about the experiences of civil society and CITES and its important contributions. I am confident that our speakers will be bestowing a multitude of messages and lessons learned to challenge us who work in CITES to consider for the future. In closing, I am reminded of a quote made by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. In our celebration of 50 years of CITES, let us recall that CITES life began with engagement by IUCN and a call for the creation of an international wildlife treaty. And let us continue to promote the important 
role of civil society in CITES. A special thanks to the ADM Capital Foundation for organizing this special webinar and our distinguished speakers for sharing their perspectives and experiences. Wonderful. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you for those um, inspiring words to get us underway. And um, thanks to US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service for co-sponsoring today's event. But even more so, Rosemary, thank you to you personally for everything you've done for a long time now for CITES and for being prepared to take on a very challenging role uh, in serving as chair of the CITES Standing Committee. And let us also recognize the extraordinary work done by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, not only within the United States, but internationally to help implement CITES and to protect wildlife more generally. So thank you very much. Absolutely delighted to, to have you with us today. It's a pleasure. Now with that, we're going to move on to the, the first um, session where we're going to talk about civil society's role in creating CITES, which Rosemary just touched upon there. And our first speaker on this topic is Professor Christina Voigt. Uh, she's the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, as well as many other roles she has. Uh, she really wanted to be with us today, but unfortunately, Christina was not able to, to get here, but she has sent us a video um, where she's going to be talking about uh, civil society's role in creating CITES. And Ira, if we could play that video now, please. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to this event in the context of the preparation for CITES 50th anniversary. We can also celebrate a 60th anniversary this year in 2023. And this is the 60th anniversary of the adoption of the IUCN resolution, which led eventually to the adoption of the convention in 1973. Because of the focus of this seminar on civil society's role in the creation, evolution and implementation of CITES, I will in my brief intervention focus on IOCN's role in this respect. Let me start with some very basic facts about the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. IUCN was created in 1984 and has evolved into the world's largest and most diverse environmental network. The organization is best known for compiling and publishing the IUCN Red List, which assesses the conservation status of species worldwide. The union consists currently of seven expert volunteer commissions, one of which is the World Commission on Environmental Law, which I have been chairing since 2021. Now, the IUCN has had significant influence in the establishment and implementation of CITES. Already in 1952, the third General Assembly of the then new IUCN in Caracas, Venezuela, adopted Resolution 96, where it stated that it is desirable that in all countries, the importation of animals belonging to species which are protected in their natural habitat should be prohibited. Hence, the Union initially argued for country level action in both legislation and enforcement. This continued to be the Union's approach until the 1960s. But it was during the 8th General Assembly in Nairobi in 1963 that the IUCN began to shift its position toward international action. By then, the new IUCN Commission on Legislation, which is the predecessor for the World Commission on Environmental Law, had begun to collect national legislation and report it to the General Assembly. Based on their reports, it became clear that the strongest measures will prove ineffective unless all governments come to an agreement. This insight led to the adoption of Resolution 5, titled Resolution, Resolution on Illegal Traffic in Wildlife Species in 1963, 60 years ago this year. It stated that the 8th General Assembly of the IUCN meeting at Nairobi in 1963 recommends that the practical and political problems involved in illegal export be studied and that an international convention on regulation of export, transit and import of rare or threatened wildlife species or their skins or trophies be drafted and submitted for the approval 
of governments by the appropriate international organizations. The mandate in this resolution provided a basis for scaling up the efforts by the IUCN Commission on Legislation to construct a text for a draft convention. François Behen gomin joined by Cyril de Clem of France and Adele uh, Wilson of the United States, became the small ad hoc drafting team for the convention. The first draft, entitled Convention on the Import, Export and Transit of Certain Species, was ready for presentation by Commission Chairman Behan in 1967. In her remarks, she pointed out that what was required was uniform worldwide legislation. In the processes that followed, the Species Survival Commission of the IUCN was responsible for identifying which species were or could be affected by trade and how they should be classified in the Convention. Originally using two appendices, Appendix 1 for species in danger of extinction and prohibited, prohibited from trade, and Appendix 2 for species whose survival was threatened by trade and therefore needed trade controls. In September 1967, a formal process started for external review where drafts were sent out through diplomatic channels to 120 countries. François Berhen gomin now legal officer of the IOCN New Environmental Law Center in Bonn in Germany, was responsible for handling the drafting process, joined at headquarters by Frank Nichols, the IOCN Deputy Director General. After formal negotiations that followed, the final text of the convention was agreed at a meeting of representatives of 80 countries in Washington DC, United States on 3rd of March, 1973. Today, the convention is virtually universally accepted with 184 countries as parties. It is considered a major achievement in the field of environmental law involving a vision within the IOCN that started more than 10 years before its conclusion. The IOCN Environmental Law Program provided persistent and pioneering work to promote and develop the treaty. It also helped countries with legal assistance toward implementation. The focus was primarily on the needs of developing countries in accordance with the Convention itself. The Environmental Law Program also produced guidelines to help countries understand their treaty obligations. In addition to legal support, IOCN also provides scientific input. CITES' aim was at the heart of the Union's mission to protect species threatened with extinction and to take measures to keep non-endangered species from becoming endangered. The primary objective of IOCN's engagement in CITES is to ensure a positive outcome for the species concerned in line with IOCN's positions and ways of working. This is achieved by providing documented evidence as formal IOCN input to CITES deliberations. The Global Species Programme coordinates IOCN's formal engagement with CITES, in particular on the Red List of Species. It supports, maintains and is uh, um, helped by the Species Survival Commission. Today, IOCN is classified as an international governmental organization observer with CITES and is widely viewed within the convention as a provider of credible and unbiased scientific, legal, and technical advice on species. IOCN has been offered for more than 60 years and is offering a quite unique array of scientific and technical expertise to CITES and can bring the diverse perspective, perspectives of its worldwide membership to bear on complex issues before CITES parties at global, regional and national levels. On behalf of the World Commission of Environmental Law of the IOCN, I would like to congratulate the CITES community on the achievements of CITES in its first 50 years 
and stand ready for continued cooperation to address the challenges to come. Thank you very much. Great. A big thank you to Christina for that speech. Um, a really interesting historical perspective. If we want to know where we are going, it's good to know where we've come from. So wonderful uh, insights there. Now, I'm sure some of you picked a, a slight slip of the tongue in Christina's speech. I reckon Sue Lieberman did. Yes, she did invert 48 with 84 when saying when IUCN was created. It was created in 1948 in Fontainebleau in France, not 1984. Now, Christina asked me to make that slight correction on her behalf. And just as an aside, did you know that the initial site secretariat was also provided by IUCN? Maybe Jonathan Barsdow can touch upon that later. Now, as we've heard, uh, CITES was signed in Washington, D.C. back in 1973. And to tell us a little bit more about all that, we're going to hear from Susan Lilas. She's the Executive Vice President of the ICCF Group. I was just with Susan yesterday in Washington, D.C., as it turns out. And um, Susan, over to you. Thank you, John. And it was great to have you with us in Washington this week. As you just heard from Christina, negotiations on CITES started following the adoption of a resolution by the IUCN General Assembly in Nairobi in 63. And CITES was eventually signed in Washington, DC a decade later. But perhaps what is not as well known is the role played by the US Congress in advancing the process, which John also shared with us on Capitol Hill this week. US Congress conducted a major review of the Lacey Act throughout the 1960s. And after several years of hearings, Congress amended the Lacey Act in 1969. Now these 1969 amendments included a direction to US Secretaries of Interior and State to seek the convening of an international ministerial meeting to conclude a binding international convention on the conservation of endangered species and very important, Congress also appropriated funding for this meeting. Following several more years of negotiations in June of 72, the UN Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm adopted a recommendation that a plenipotentiary conference be convened as soon as possible in order to prepare and adopt an international convention on wildlife trade. Well, since the US Congress had already supported and allocated funding back in 69. The US government agreed to host this conference in Washington DC in February of 1973. It was co-hosted by Department of State and Department of Interior and it was named the World Wildlife Conference. CITES text was concluded and signed on March 3rd, 1973 in Washington DC and that's why many countries refer to CITES as the Washington Convention. CITES entered into force just over two years later on July 1st, 1975, and the US was the first state to join the convention, which today has 184 parties. So thank you, John, and back to you. Great, thanks very much, Susan, for those insights. I think it's uh, really interesting to hear that history. And thanks also for hosting such a wonderful event on Capitol Hill uh, just on Tuesday, uh, where you brought a number of members of Congress together, along with civil society and uh, government agencies all together uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of CITES. So thank you very much for doing that. Now, uh, colleagues, we're going to move to our first panel session. So those of you who are on the first panel, please feel free to put on your video screens and to unmute. Now, our first panel is on civil society and the evolution of CITES. We just talked about the creation, had some wonderful insights there. We're going to move to the evolution of CITES. And for this session, we're joined by an extremely knowledgeable panel. We've got Dan Ash. He's the president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Dr. Susan Lieberman. She's the vice president, international policy with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Will Travers, OBE. He's the co-founder and executive president of the Born Free Foundation. And we also have our commentator, Jonathan Barstow. Now he's currently an independent CITES consultant, but he used to serve for many years in, these, in the CITES secretariat, as I think many of you know. So welcome to you colleagues. And um, you've all got a vast amount of experience with CITES. And uh, during the course of our conversation, it would be great if you could 
give people a little bit of an insight as to how you got tangled up with this convention. Um, but just do that as a part of your response to the, the panel session, because I'd like to move straight into it. Um, I am going to move between you from time to time, so don't worry, it's not going to be one bite at the apple. You're going to have multiple chances to engage. Now, Will, I'm going to come to you first. Are you ready? I'll do my best, yes. Okay. So, Will, how did you first get involved in CITES? How long have you been involved for and in what capacity has it evolved for you individually? Uh, it, it certainly has. So I, I got involved in 1989. Um, that was the seventh conference of the parties in Lausanne. And for my sins, I, I'd collected a petition of just over 600,000 names and addresses. And in those days, this was not electronic. It was on paper uh, in the UK um, on behalf of the approximately 600,000 elephants that were alive in Africa. Um, by the estimates that were given at the time. And I drove those petitions in the back of a, of a station wagon all the way to Lausanne in Switzerland. I presented them to uh, His Highness Prince Sadruddin Aga Khan, who then presented them to the chair of the standing committee. I believe his name was Morgan Stern, Morgan Stern something. Uh, my memory fails me because it's that long ago. But, I, but that was my first taste of CITES. And in terms of evolution, I've then been to all the CITES meetings subsequently. And what I realized along with other colleagues was that uh, I went to the one in Kyoto, then the one in the USA. And I realized that there were multiple voices and increasing numbers of voices wanting to participate from a civil society perspective as the convention grew, but that there was probably a need for us not to consume all the time of the CITES meetings with interventions from non-government uh, organizations and civil society representatives. So in 1992-94, we formed a thing called the Species Survival Network, which has just over 80 organizations worldwide. So when I attend CITES now, I attend on behalf of SSN, and we, we coordinate our positions, all 80 organizations coordinate our positions beforehand so that we can present our views on the proposals and the resolutions, the draft proposals and resolutions before us. We can offer expert opinion across a wide range of disciplines and we can maximize our ability to raise issues while minimizing or least curtailing our enthusiasm to get incredibly involved in every issue by making sure that we don't make the same intervention 80 times. That's extremely interesting, Will, and I'm sure Rosemary is very happy to hear that as the, as the <laughs> incoming chair of the standing committee. And I know certainly in meetings I participated in, in supporting chairs, uh, having NGOs coordinate themselves so that you have not so many interventions was, was very useful. Now, Will, I, I wanna pick your brains on something. And this is something we've discussed before. Now, when you go to CITES meetings today, there are literally hundreds of observers, you know, from private sector, non-government sector, uh, local communities, indigenous peoples. Uh, they're all there participating in these, in these meetings, in these COPs and in these standing committees. Now, you've been around these meetings for a long time. I want you to focus on the standing committee because I'd like Sue to talk a little bit more about the COP. But what, what evolution have you seen in the way in which the standing committee conducts itself when it comes to engaging with civil society? Well, and I'm really obviously delighted that Rosemary Nam is going to be chairing the standing committee and my congratulations to her. Um, it was really clear in the early days, and I'm going back into the sort of 1990s, that the standing committee, unlike the COP, really didn't have much of an opportunity for civil society and non-government organizations to, to be represented. I mean, we did have the extraordinary situation, possibly Jonathan remembers this, I'm not sure, of, of um, those from a precautionary perspective, so SSN, and those from a more uh, utilitarian perspective, being invited to go to the cafeteria in the, in the conference center in Geneva to stand on a table uh, for, I think it was like 15 minutes each. So we had half an hour to rattle through everything that we had sort of been considering in the run up to the standing committee meeting to those members of standing committee who didn't want to go to the bar afterwards and, would, and wanted to go downstairs to the cafeteria. I mean, frankly, it was farcical. and It really was. And, and it wasn't just NGOs who felt that. I think a number of parties, great number of parties felt this was not appropriate. 
So I, I started talking in detail with Ken Stansel, who chaired the standing committee between 2000 and 2004, and he very strongly agreed with this. And so uh, it was really through his leadership that the standing committee turned into not an opportunity for NGOs to have half an hour over the three or four days of the standing committee, but to actually be able to participate fully in the standing committee, I think except for a closed session of about two hours, which was to do with um, infractions and possibly to do with finances. But broadly speaking, we are now, all of us, all civil society, all perspectives, um, able to participate in the standing committee just as we do in the COP itself. And I think that that provides a great deal of continuity, important continuity between these big uh, uh, flagship events, the conferences of the parties. The, the work of CITES does not stop just when the conference of the parties ends. Mm. That's interesting, Will. So before this change, and when you were meeting in the cafeteria, the standing committee would be meeting in private, yeah? And they'd just come downstairs and have a cup of coffee to meet with with your organisations and others? Uh, yes, broadly. I, I suspect, obviously, that there were some organisations, IUCN, for example, who would have been part of the standing committee meeting, but the vast majority of organisations who took a strong interest in CITES and had, I think they would feel, something to offer, either technical information or uh, insights into global trade patterns, all sorts of different um, uh, components that they could bring to the attention of the parties. Ultimately, the parties, of course, do make the decisions. But in that whole process over the intercessional period, it was really important, I think, that the, uh, the parties to CITES were as informed as possible through the Standing Committee and through the CITES Secretariat. So I, I feel like it was a a major step forward and it was done, as I say, without fear or favour. Our lobbying was not on behalf of ourselves, it was on behalf of all uh, perspectives and, and views within uh, the wider world. That's a really interesting development and Jonathan, I'm just going to put you on notice because I want to get your personal perspective on how that impacted you and your work in the Secretariat, but I'm going to come to you at the end because I want to come to Sue Lieberman now. And uh, Sue, your, your name resonated very loudly with me, as did everyone on both these panels uh, when I joined the CITES Secretariat. Um, I think you've probably been around CITES much longer than you care to remember. <laughs> and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that you have actually participated in 13 meetings at the conferences of the parties, which um, is uh, a bigger number than the age of my daughter. Now, Thanks for that, yeah. <laughs> Now, Sue, so it would be great if you could let us know, and I know you've been involved with CITES, many different perspectives, but could you let us know how you got tangled up with CITES in many different roles and, and what you're doing now? Sure, happy to do so. And yes, I have been to all 13 of the last CITES meetings of the Conference of the Parties, Standing Committees, Animals Committee. I think I missed one Animals Committee somewhere in there. And I do want to say hello. I wasn't able to in the chat to, to many friends and colleagues over the years from, from work on CITES. Um, I got first involved, surprisingly, before I ever worked on CITES when I was doing a postdoc on, on desert tortoises in Mexico. And we had a very, uh, an ill tortoise. Uh, CITES, it's on CITES Appendix 1, Gopherus flavo marginatus. And we had to bring it from Mexico into Arizona. And someone said, well, we have to get the CITES permit. And I think, what's that? <laughs> you know, this was, I, honestly, well, how would you know? I mean, first of all, this was the early 80s. CITES was very, very young. And we had to get the permit from the U.S. government and the Mexican government. So that was my first dealing with CITES. And then after I finished my po my two postdocs looking for a job, and I got a job with it, looked at a job with an NGO in Washington working on CITES. I thought, I remember that. It's that permit thing. And then I realized it's a lot more than the permit thing. And I have had the um, opportunity, honor, depends on how you look at it, for working both for NGOs, more than one NGO, as well as for the U.S. government. And I ran, I, I had the job that Rose has now, not the standing committee job, but the heading the U.S. scientific authority for, for many years. And I think it's important to understand CITES, both from the perspective of management and scientific authorities and, and NGOs. So that's how I sort of got wrapped up in it. And um, I think there, there's a number of things, I know you have some questions to ask me, but I think I've always felt over the years, particularly since I attend other multilateral environmental agreements, 
that one of the tremendous strengths of CITES is not just the engagement of NGOs and the opportunity for civil society to engage, but the diversity and breadth of NGOs. While that's frustrating sometimes for governments and for NGOs, the breadth of engagement, not just the numbers. I took a look last night, COP2 um, had 53 observer organizations, international and national, and the last one had 151. Right, but at least the number of observer and of NGOs was fewer than the number of parties, uh, which is always Im important. But I think that that includes not just conservation or organizations, animal welfare groups, but also trade organizations, traders, the Japanese Beko and the Japanese Ivory Association and the hunting associations. And I think that's a, that while that's frustrating sometimes, it's also incredibly important. It shows the value of CITES. So other treaties I go to may not have a diversity of NGOs because they don't have real world consequences. CITES has teeth and CITES has impact. And I think that people talk about what's the effectiveness of CITES. If CITES didn't have impact, then you wouldn't have 151 NGO organizations, nine uh, UN organizations, and 17 intergovernmental organizations at the last COP. So uh, that's how I got involved. And um, I'm also commit, very committed to making sure and working with parties on their implementation and making sure they understand. And, how, and NGOs have an important role. Many parties, if, not, if they're not new to CITES, they have low capacity or the staff assigned to the management and scientific authorities are new. And I find often parties have no idea how to engage no idea how to submit a proposal and NGOs, particularly those with with long term expertise have an important role in helping parties just understand how to engage, because it's gotten complex over the years. No, good point. So you've seen quite an evolution from the conference, the party's point of view. And if you'd like to share some more insights and, you know, from the first cop you went to to the last cop you went to, you know, is it dramatically different? And what I'd like to do, Sue, is ask you to then move on to a question I'd like to ask you. You've been at 13 COPs. We've seen many listing proposals over that period of time. Can you share with us what would be, you know, just the one, two or three most memorable listings uh, from your perspective? Well, there are, there are both memorable listings and memorable non-listings. What I mean, <laughs> there are also proposals for for downlisting, moving a species or a taxon from appendix one to two to enable trade. And there are quite a few memorable ones that shall we say were not adopted as well. But I think in, in the ev evolution of CITES, as I said, you're seeing a broader diversity of conservation organizations and other NGOs attending and engaging not only with the COP, not only with the standing committee, Yes, it was a long process. Ken Stanzel had a role, but a lot of parties as well, a lot of NGOs worked to open up the standing committee. My first standing committee that I attended had 40 people in a small room. It wasn't that exciting a meeting. And as NGOs have engaged more, there's been much more dynamism to, to, to the process and dealing with diverse issues. I think we would not have as many sharks that, that we have now for example, listed on CITES and subject to the, the management and, and, and trade control measures of CITES without the active engagement of, of civil society NGOs, bringing to the attention of governments the declining populations of sharks, the impact of trade, and the need to look at sharks as wildlife, not only as, as food, not only as fisheries products. Just, just one example. And I think over the years at the COP, in particular, which engages both with species proposals, which I'll give some examples, and with, with other issues. There are working groups of the COP. What goes on in the, in the actual plenary is not nearly as dynamic as the working groups. And there's active engagement, of course, of parties, and much more engagement of parties from the global south, which is really important, but also much more engagement of, of observers in those working groups. Now, I attended a working group. It's, my first working group was COP7, having to do with African elephants. But there's much more engagement across these, these working groups and issues that, than there was previously. And much more engagement of trade interests who feel that their commercial interests um, 
they want to protect their commercial interests. And sometimes that means not providing maybe the protection necessary for species, but that's okay. It creates that diversity. And as a result of that, there's been much more media attention on CITES. Though there was plenty of media attention at COP7 when the elephant was put to Appendix 1, there is much more broad media attention, civil society attention now that, than there used to be. And I think, I think that's all for the best. CITES, if it was just behind closed doors without NGO engagement, would not be what it is today. Recognize successes, 184 parties. So the, in terms of species proposals, civil society NGOs have an important role in, in, in providing input to governments. Governments, it's not that governments sit there and say, we want to list this species, and then you get to the COP and some NGOs say, oh, support that. Uh, the U.S., for example, has a process of inviting input from, from NGOs. And often in many of the countries we work in, particularly developing countries, I found as WCS and previously, governments need help. They say we're seeing declines in the species. We think CITES should play a role. What do we do? How do we submit a CITES proposal? I, I've been asked by governments, what do we do? I, the species is in trouble, but we don't even know how to write a CITES proposal. The NGOs, obviously the proposal belongs to the government, not the NGO, but many times NGOs can provide the scientific input, the trade data, et cetera, to, to assist governments in drafting proposals and to advocate for proposals or sometimes to advocate against a proposal that may be driven by commercial interest, but not really in the best interest of, of the species. Obviously the most memorable proposal, I, I wouldn't say obviously, that's not true. One of the most memorable is the putting the African elephant in appendix one. I mean, I was, I was new to CITES, so it's with the ability to do that, to galvanize that kind of public attention and work with governments was exciting. The listing of the African gray parrot on Appendix 1 uh, was extremely important because that came from the range states. It came from Gabon and other range states saying, we need help. The, there's so much in illegal trade. This species needs help. Where do we start? How do, what do we do? And I think the last COP is quite memorable because of all the, turtle, the proposals for freshwater turtles. It's not a victory that they all qualify for Appendix 2 because of really there's no management in many, many countries. But the collaboration between NGOs um, and scientists and those of us working on the ground in the field and government's proponents and, and supporters when we got to the COP was, was quite memorable. It was truly a, a broad collaborative effort. That's just some of many examples I could give you. Fabulous. Thanks, Sue. Really interesting. Thanks, Will and Sue. Really interesting to look at the standing committee and the, and the COP and the evolution there. Now, Dan, I'm going to come to you. And um, you now head an organization that represents zoos and aquariums. And you often find yourself on the opposite side of the table from Will and the organizations that he represents. And I think that's what we've already been talking about. Um, CITES brings together so many different organizations with different perspectives, all under one roof, where you can thrash it out and uh, see where the, the decisions land based upon the way the parties uh, decide. Now, you've also though been the director of the Fish and Wildlife, US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think that's when we uh, first met each other. Um, and that's the US uh, CITES Management Authority. Now. You've had a lot of experience, both sides of the fence there, as many other colleagues have. Dan, how did you first get involved uh, in CITES? Thanks, John, and thanks, everybody. And I'm wishing everybody a, a wonderful World Wildlife Day. Um, I was kind of conscripted into uh, um, engagement into CITES as a policymaker in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I, my, my first engagement with CITES was really in preparation for the Doha um, COP as a as then a deputy director at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then head of delegation for the U.S. at the Bangkok and and Johannesburg uh, COPs and so so I was uh, pretty much conscripted into service as a as a CITES participant and I do want to um, I don't want to reiterate what Sue said I think that the um, my history uh, is that there's a rich uh, role and and uh, for the uh, civil society and non-government organizations in CITES. And the U.S., I think every country uh, needs to frame its own method, um, but the goal is to increase uh, inclusion and transparency into what 
uh, governments are doing in preparation for and leading into uh, the um, CITES participation. And, um, and every country will appro approach that differently. In the US, we have both a formal and informal uh, approaches toward uh, engagement with, uh, you know, we in the US, our practice is to publish our proposals uh, as we lead up to a COP. We, we get public comment on that. And uh, there's uh, some dialogue. It tends to be rather formalistic and um, and static, I guess I would say, but uh, but then behind that, there's a much richer conversation that is, you know, with uh, people like uh, Sue Lieberman and Will Travers and 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 many of the other people on this screen, and so uh, and and that's important in in preparing and leading up to a COP, and um, and I think the some of the uh, things I've heard mentioned here, sharks and rays. Um, African gray parrot. I think NGOs um, really help the government prepare and know how to um, work in, in the context of a COP, how to lobby, wh wh who is voting which way, who do I need to talk to, Where? how do we need to deploy the delegation um, in preparation for a, for a vote. Um, and, and also kind of bringing passion to the causes of maybe some species that have less celebrity, like pangolin and nautilus and, um, and species like that. So I think NGOs provide a critical role in that capacity. Um, and in my experience, um, NGOs have, have played an important role working with governments on maybe causes that don't have much um, likelihood of success in CITES, like bluefin tuna. Um, but um, by bringing them to CITES in site action by um, other regulatory bodies like the International Convention on Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And so um, CITES can play a leveraging role there and NGOs certainly help um, in uh, informing government that there's an opportunity here to play a leveraging role. So I think there's a very rich history of, of collaboration between government and NGO. I would say looking forward into the future, I think there's a responsibility of civil society to help secure the resources that CITES, scientific and management authorities need to do their job because CITES is extraordinarily complex. And as we add more species um, to uh, the, the appendices of CITES, the burden on governments um, is becoming crushing, I would say. And now, John, as, as someone who's on the flip side of that, as a regulated party, and you know, our member zoos and aquariums depend on sustainable and uh, uh, a predictable trade and processes to support trade, uh, I, I would say my experience is that the U.S. Management Authority is struggling under a, a pretty severe um, crushing uh, permitting burden. And, and so uh, if the US management authority is struggling, I can only imagine what's happening in the rest of the, in the rest of the world. So I would, I would say the, the civil, civil society has a, has, a, has a very important role to play and responsibility to make sure that CITES management and, sci and scientific authorities have the resources that they need to do their work. Very good, Dan. That's that's really interesting. And um, this issue of capacity, you know, across all parties is obviously an issue. Can I ask one thing for people that are, are not all that familiar with the US process? Um, when the US consults on its proposals, is that um, uh, is the ability to provide feedback to the US government uh, limited to US citizens? Or can anyone, you know, provide input to the US government on their, um, their proposals that they're putting forward? Um, no, anyone could provide input. Um, so, in you know, it, they, again, it's a it's a it's a formalistic process. So, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service publishes a notice in the Federal Register, um, and uh, um, and indicates the the proposal we are likely um, to pursue uh, during a COP. Um, anyone could comment on that. You you have you have to be aware um, of that process and have um, access to that process. But uh, yeah, any 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 individual, any organization could comment. Okay, really interesting. I think it's important for people to know that. Uh, so thanks, Dan. Really interesting insights there from someone who's you know been the regulator and the regulated. 
Um, and uh, we see quite a bit of that in CITES actually with people in, in the next panel we'll see as well have worked both sides of the, of the fence. Now, Jonathan, I'm going to come to you as our commentator. Um, now, Jonathan, you've had experience across multiple sectors uh, with CITES, um, vast experience there. It's your experience with the CITES Secretariat we're most interested in today because we've had a perspective from those outside of the Secretariat. Now, obviously, you're not with the Secretariat. You can't speak for the Secretariat. You're speaking from a personal perspective. So you're just providing your own uh, personal reflections. Uh, it must have had some impact uh, on the Secretariat as uh, the Standing Committee and the COP was opening up for more active engagement from civil society. What, what did that feel like in the Secretariat that is there to you know, organise and service the meetings uh, that we've been talking about. Thanks, John. So, uh, yeah, as you say, first of all, I should emphasise, as you said, that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Secretariat. But, uh, yeah, from my reflections of the past, you know, if I, look, if I think back to when I started inside the Secretariat, it was in 1991, we were in a small office in Lausanne, and the meetings of the standing committee were held in a small room at the bottom of the building right next door to the funeral parlor. And uh, there were, I don't know, about a dozen people in the room. It wasn't only NGOs that were excluded, other parties were excluded. There's the only meetings of the, the standing committee itself. So, um, yeah, we have about a dozen people. If you look at the, the meetings of the standing committee now, what have we got? Uh, we've got hundreds of people, hundreds of people come to the meetings in Geneva, where the Society Secretariat is based now, and uh, meet at the, uh, the Conference Centre of Geneva. So, as you can imagine, then, the, the major impact for the Secretariat was, gonna, was a logistical one, just making all those arrangements to, to enable people to participate, not just to sit in the back of the room, but also have the, the, need, have the uh, possibility to speak, to have the seating arranged, to have a translation and interpretation, to provide the documentation. Uh, it's electronic now, but it wasn't electronic when we started. So all of those things, you can imagine providing the paperwork. It was, a, it was just a, a much bigger, uh, of the much bigger logistical burden to deal with. And of course, as you can imagine, it wasn't just the standing committee, it was the, the COP. When I started, my first COP was uh, 1983 in Botswana. There were very few uh, NGOs there too. Uh, I was one of them. I was in a, there as an NGO, but um, you know, those that meeting was in a, in a tent in the garden of a hotel. We rolled up the sides of the of the tent to see the the pigs running around in the garden. You can't do that now. There are thousands of people, two to three thousand people, come to these meetings. Yeah. And I think also if you look at what's happened with the concerns of the parties as that development has taken place. They went through a bit of a difficult period when they were worried about uh, about observers, NGO observers coming into the area where the, the parties were, disturbing them when they were trying to focus on the meeting. They were worried about the documents that were being distributed during the meeting, and some of the documents very very very, uh, very critical. They adopted a number of rules to, to govern these sorts of things. And uh, they adopted rules relating to all sorts of, of aspects of, of a meeting. Um, yes, regarding where you can walk, where you can sit, what documents you can distribute, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. They, they went through a difficult period also with the other two committees, the Animals and Plants Committees, where in some of the, the groups, the also in the, the working groups of the Conference of Parties, where NGOs were, were outnumbering the representatives of the parties. As a result of which the, the, the parties have now developed the rules to try and deal with that as well. So all of those changes, of course, the Secretariat, Secretariat had to deal with the changes of the rules to assist in pr providing rules that were going to be manageable. Um, of course, the increasing number of NGO observers also meant increasing number of desires to speak. Um, which meant more time was required for these meetings, they got longer and longer. Of course, that's gov governing or managing those requires requests to speak is, is a problem for the chair more than for the secretariat. But and it's great that, as uh, as Will mentioned earlier on, a large number of organisations have got together in order to to put forward uh, a joint point of view. That's very helpful. 
uh, as having been a, a chair of one of the society's committees myself, I know that that, that really does help a lot in dealing with the, the time issues. So those are some key reflections, I think. You, you mentioned one other thing that I should probably comment on, because you, you mentioned earlier on the fact that um, the fact that although the convention says that UNEP provides the secretariat, it also says that it may be assisted by an IGO or an NGO or a national organization. And as you, uh, I think as you hinted, IEC actually was asked to provide that administration when the convention started, or when the secretariat started off. Mm. So uh, until the, the trust fund was created and parties started putting money into a trust fund, and then UNEP could, could take it on. Mm. So uh, yeah, that's uh, an important development too. Yeah, that's a very interesting part of the history itself, which should uh, be interesting to delve into one day. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, how many COPs have you attended, by the way? Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen? Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't get to Panama, unfortunately, because there was another COP here in, in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. No, you were assisting the Secretariat with the, the Ramsar COP uh, here in Switzerland. Uh, you were in uh, high demand. That's very interesting. There we go. Well, we'll see if anyone online can trump 15 COPs. <laughs> I think that's highly unlikely. But uh, let's see. Look, um, colleagues, uh, I did have a few follow-up questions, but I want to give the second panel an opportunity to engage, and then we'll all come back together. And if we have remaining time, then we'll have a chance to continue the conversation. Um, but that's really fascinating. Beautiful insights, uh, fascinating insights from all of you. Such deep expertise uh, individually and collectively. So thanks for joining us, but don't go. Uh, just mute your microphone and your screen, but stay with us because we're all going to convene uh, back as a, as a full panel in a little while. So I can invite the, the second panel uh, to unmute and um, um, put on your video. I know that um, our good colleague, Dr. Jingfeng Zhou, is having a little bit of problem connecting, uh, but I'm also told uh, by his colleagues that have connected us that we have... Uh, 1,100 people in China that are live streaming uh, this event as we speak, which is fantastic. So we'll hope that um, uh, Jingfeng Zhou is able to join with us. I'm going to introduce you all um, to our second panel. And our second panel uh, is on civil society and the implementation of CITES. And once again, we're joined by an extraordinarily experienced uh, panel. We're so delighted to have you all with us. Uh, we have Dr. Winnie Kiru. She's the Executive Director of the Impala Research Centre. That's a job she just took on, uh, that leadership role there. Winnie, great stuff. Actually, one day we'll have a chat online with everybody about that. But um, Winnie's there. She was previously with the Elephant Protection Initiative. We have Vivek Menon. He's the Founder and Executive Director of the Wildlife Trust of India, but is also involved with all manner of other organizations, uh, including IUCN in a very, in a very deep way. Uh, thankfully, I'm not talking to him today about cricket. For those of you who follow it, India has been doing some damage to Australia. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but great to have you here. We also have uh, Dr. Jin Feng Zhou. He's the Secretary General at the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. Um, he's having a few problems getting online. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us but delighted to have him there, very active in China um, and very vocal in China about issues to do with wildlife. And we have as our commentator, Professor Maria Ivanova. She's the professor and director at the Northeastern School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. That's a relatively new role for her, an exciting new job. But uh, Maria's done an extraordinary amount of work on looking at UNEP and uh, multilateral environmental agreements and how they are uh, being implemented. So welcome colleagues. Uh, as with the previous panel, um, you know, you've all got a vast amount of experience in answering the questions. I, I hope you share that with us, how you got involved uh, with CITES and how you're involved with, this, with the convention now. But we'll get the conversation uh, underway straight away, um, move right in it. And Winnie, I'd like to start with you, if that's all right. Uh, as I mentioned, firstly, congratulations on the new job. And, and Winnie's become a bit of a birder, she was telling us earlier, uh, since she's got this new job. Uh, but you've been active with many NGOs, uh, most notably Elephant Protection Initiative, but not only. But you've also served on the official Kenyan delegation, and I think that was to CITES COP16. Now, Kenya has a very long and proud history uh, of association with CITES, and we heard that from Christina. 
um, I think earlier, can you actually put forward a, a proposed convention text um, in the late 1960s uh, for CITES? Could you give us, Winnie, some insights as to how you first got tangled up with uh, CITES? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John. And indeed, it is an exciting new phase in my life. Mpala Research Center is based uh, in Laikipia in northern Kenya. And uh, it brings together the Princeton University as a managing partner and the Smithsonian um, and Kenya Wildlife Service, the National Museums of Kenya, all working together to advance research in, in wildlife um, ecology and expanding more and more into other areas of research that are relevant to Kenya and Africa. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be um, you know, leading that, that uh, institution and bringing together a whole lot of good scientists to look at different issues, uh, especially around ecology. So how did I get involved in CITES? So my early years, I worked for Kenya Wildlife Service when elephants were actually listed in Appendix 1. I was a young scientist in the elephant protect program in KWS. And I remember Richard Leakey, the late Richard Leakey, good friend. And, and uh, you know, everybody remembers the energy that uh, Richard Leakey mm -hmm. brought into the space of the uplisting of elephants mm -hmm. in Appendix 1. I was just a young scientist. I was running around the corridors, not really understanding what was going on. And then three years later in the year 2000, I met up with Will Travers and Will Travers was preparing for CITES that had suddenly been moved to Nairobi because I think the country that was supposed to host CITES in 2000 couldn't for some reason. And there was a frantic effort to do all the logistics work to get CITES um, to NGOs to, to CITES. And I was asked by Will Travers to work, you know, on the logistical front to get uh, all the SSN people, uh, you know, room and all and all the preparation for sites. And I realized at that point that this was serious stuff. You know, it was really very challenging, the logistical detail that was needed. Anyway, going forward, I really benefited from the training that I then got from SSM colleagues. You know, I was immediately moved from logistics to actually now <laughs> learning about CITES and how CITES works. And, and I was amazed by just the level of detail that was involved in preparing for the convention. And so when I started to now engage with my country and how we were preparing for CITES, I realized just how limited and how challenging it was. Kenya had a very good structure. We have a good management authority, the scientific authority, the National Museums of Kenya was very active, but still the people preparing for CITES, that's not their full-time job. They have full-time jobs to do. And then there is CITES. And then in between, you know, CITES is not just a COP, there's the standing committee, there is the Plants and Animals Committee. There's all these documents, there are you know, proposals to be written. There's lots of data that's required to be put together. Sadly, in, in, in the, the, the lack of central data basis is a big challenge in Africa, that when you're writing a proposal, you're looking for data everywhere. There's a real migration of data uh, from the South to the North. And then we never get access to this data. So you're there writing a proposal, but actually there's a lot of research that has been done around whatever species you're, but you don't have the data. You don't have that information. It's domiciled somewhere else. And, and one of the questions I would like us to, is where is the expertise? Why is the expertise? Why is research so extractive? Where does it move information from the South? to the north and feel no need to bring it back where when we want to write a proposal, when we want to engage in a place where we require to give good data, good information, we don't have it. And so my one frustration and what I realized is just the amount of effort that countries like Kenya have to put in. Remember, we are dealing with flora, we are dealing with fauna, we are dealing with you know, you're dealing with uh, aquatics, you know, fish, you, sharks, all this. And to bring together all that expertise 
it's difficult. And then come in the role of NGOs. And I, I must say, and I want to echo what has been said here in this meeting, okay, NGOs have engaged in the most passionate and giving way to countries that require their help. And I have learned from working with them is that it's almost a work of passion for a lot of these NGOs. They give everything to help prepare countries. So to me, this conversation is, is really important because it, it I have engaged both as an NGO, on the NGO side, and I've also engaged as a part, as a member of delegation for Kenya and realizing just the effort it takes to put together the delegation, to put together the information, to then go to CITES and pre pre present it in a meaningful way. CITES is a convention that a lot of decisions are made through votes. You have to then lobby. You don't know how to do that. <laughs> you know, you think that because you have a very good presentation and you've got good data, that that is not what works. You still have to lobby. And, and NGOs are so good at it and, and are really helping countries understand what lobbying is, how do you target your lobbying, who do you need to speak to, how do you track who you're speaking to, all that. And so I think that Kenya has been very successful in bringing together the local NGOs, the local um, uh, expertise, and also harnessing the international expertise and for a lot of African countries, this has not been possible. And you can easily see the challenge of meaningfully um, engaging at CITES for African countries. And I think that I, in, I would like to see greater recognition of those challenges and real effort to help countries in the global South to meaningfully engage in CITES and, and, and maybe even other conventions. No, really important points there, there Winnie. And I, I think one thing that Kenya is perhaps remembered for, although this is, you know, perhaps because it hits the headlines, because Kenya has been so active with this convention since 1963, when the, um, the IUCN uh, General Assembly met there, right through to doing a draft convention text, right through to today. But the destruction of ivory, we, we remember Richard Leakey, um, uh, with the destruction library, but then more recently uh, with former President Kenyatta in 2016, when he brought several presidents together uh, to destroy ivory to make a point about the, the scale and, and, uh, and impact of the illegal peeling of the African elephant. Could you just give us a few insights on that from, a, from, a, from your perspective, because you were quite actively engaged in that, or certainly in the 2016 one, I should say. <laughs> yes, I remember a call just before midnight one day from Richard Leakey, <laughs> after we had had some conversations about the need to inventory Kenya's ivory. And uh, he called me and said, Winnie, can you actually do an inventory of all the ivory we have in our stores? I said, yes. And I actually, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but <laughs> then I quickly got in touch with, uh, at that time, Stop Ivory, I was working, um, you know, as a consultant for Stop Ivory, I said, look, we have an opportunity to actually inventory Kenya's ivory and quickly put together resources to do it. And then I became the project leader for this work. And it was probably the most difficult piece of work I have ever done. Why was it so difficult? It's because those of us who engage with CITES do not always appreciate the ivory conversation. In many of these African countries, storing ivory is extremely challenging because ivory is bulky. The value of ivory is written everywhere in all media that you know, you're, you're guarding stuff that's worth millions of dollars. The people who get then the job of looking after the ivory, their life is always on the line. They, the, Wildlife organizations don't always have the ability to store this ivory properly. And so the person in charge is always a suspect. <laughs> They're always kind of suspected of either pilfering the ivory. So the landscape of fear, that's what I call it, that actually 
envelops this whole ivory situation is very difficult to understand until you actually start to engage with ivory. And I've had the privilege of working not just in Kenya, but in many other African countries, thanks to the EPI and Stop Ivory. And I cannot tell you how that landscape of fear shapes every discussion and everything to do with ivory. I have met people in African countries who have a key around their neck. They cannot go and leave. They cannot participate in normal life activities just because they're in charge of the ivory room. And so there we were in Kenya. Uh, it was, everybody knew we had plenty of ivory, but nobody knew how much what it was. And so the job fell on me to go to every store, starting from the central stores in Nairobi and across the country, 24 different stores to actually first digitize, you know, inventory, every piece of ivory in those stores. I, will, I don't have enough time to describe what that was like, but I can tell you the smell of death in those stores cannot leave me. It was the most horrific, the most horrific thing that I have ever done. And the team that I was working with, one time I was working with 204 people. Mm. And it was a nightmare of a job, but we did it. We finished in Nairobi, and then we went to the other parts of the country and we inventoried every single piece. As soon as we finished, Richard Leakey said, now I've spoken to the president, we have this to destroy this ivory. And it was like a hundred tons of ivory. How do you do that? No, ivory doesn't burn as easily as <laughs> people say. We had to actually get someone who had worked in movie sets in Hollywood to come and <laughs> help us understand how you do this huge burn and actually create enough of a, enough visuals for it to not just be something that people see piles of stuff burning. And I think many of you remember, and many of you have seen the images that came from that work what you don't know is the pain <laughs> that was involved in bringing that ivory to Nairobi, stacking it in those uh, piles that we did. And actually the physical pain of seeing tasks that were of elephants from Amboseli that sometimes I thought I probably knew this elephant, you know, to, to it wasn't just an exercise of burning tasks. You were literally, burning tasks of elephants that I had known. So it was a very emotional exercise. It, it was terrible. I remember going two days after the president had set the, the thing of ablaze and the ivory, some of it didn't burn very well. And he was, you were looking at it, it was like a funeral pyre, you know, you could see Amboseli, um, you know, the way we had marked the and And you'd think, I probably knew this elephant. And those, that, yes, it, it was good for us. Uh, in terms of CITES, remember, it was the time that Kenya was actually rated as Gang of Eight, and we were having a very bad time with, with CITES. We were in the near process. Things weren't going very well for us, but that ivory ban made a, a good statement, helped us to get out of this, this problem. But... I, th I thank you for giving me the opportunity to just say that countries that then have to hold the stocks, is, it's something that needs to be thought about. They need to be seen for what kind of work they are doing. It's not just the live animals they have to look after. They have to look after this ivory pangolin skills, a lot of it that is seized through the illegal trade. And if you think about a country of Kenya, like Kenya with a hundred tons of ivory, where do you put it? How do you store it in a way that is safe and secure? How do you communicate to parliament that this ivory has no value? so that you can be given the permission to destroy it. Because the next day, the headlines in the newspaper say, Kenya burns money. The political cost of destroying this ivory is also high because not everybody understands the processes. Not everybody understands what CITES is about. So I, I, I just think that 
countries in the global south need to be understood, that these conversations need to be heard more to really get what it is like to participate in these processes because they are costly and they don't just cost lives of animals, they cost lives of people and they cause heartache and heartbreak for those of us who have to participate in these processes. Thank you, Winnie. Thanks for sharing that really, really extraordinary insights. Um, really appreciate that. Um, and we're going to move to from uh, your part of the world to, to South Asia um, with Vivek uh, Menon. And Vivek actually is someone who has talked uh, often about the 50 range states of the elephant, uh, the African and the Asian range states. And I know he still has a has a vision for bringing them together. And I, I very much share his vision there, but that's not what we're talking about today, but it's uh, it's one thing I, I think of very much when I, I think of Vivek. Vivek, you've also uh, straddled the fence between the non-government sector and also with the uh, being part of the uh, Indian uh, delegation uh, to Conference of the Parties. You've been very active with the IUCN, uh, which is has a certain intergovernmental status now. Could you give us a sense of how you got involved uh, with CITES and, and how you're involved today? Sure. Uh, thank you, John, uh, for inviting me to this uh, meeting. And congratulations, everybody, uh, for CITES at 50, because uh, I think this is a, a tremendous achievement of all the range states, uh, all civil society and the secretariat. So I think those of you past and present who are here, uh, first thing is to say is congratulations. So, uh, John, I got involved uh, in 1990, uh, so not as many uh, meetings as, as Jonathan or Sue. Uh, actually, only 10 COPs, because the first two, uh, I was too junior to attend the COP in one. I, I, I did the standing committee, but it was bumped off the COP. And the next one, the Americans didn't give me a visa. So I didn't, I didn't do Fort Lauderdale either. So I ended up in 97 in Harare as my first COP, but 33 years in attending CITES. Uh, I was hired to by Mr. Ashok Kumar, who some of you may know, uh, who was in the Environment Ministry then, uh, to help him set up traffic in India. Uh, and therefore, in uh, 1990, I was packed off to Jacques Bernay in uh, the CITES Secretariat to discuss what CITES was. Uh, and uh, Jorgen Thompson in the Traffic International Office and came back to India in 91, Traffic India was born. So the first uh, several meetings of CITES, I attended as uh, an international NGO, as Traffic. Uh, and then in 98, when I left Traffic and founded my own organization called the Wildlife Trust of India, um, I attended CITES as a national NGO, as Wildlife Trust for a couple of uh, COPs. But all the while, I've been working very, very closely with the Ministry of Environment and Forest and several ministers uh, in, in shaping their uh, worldview to CITES, as well as many other UN conventions. I was part of uh, uh, the Ministerial CITES Task Force for many years. As a result, very soon I got drafted on as a technical advisor to India uh, for the delegation. And I've attended five uh, COPs and several standing committees and other things as India uh, as a technical advisor to the Indian delegation. And the very last one in Panama, uh, being on the board of uh, the IUCN, just like Sue Lieberman is as well, uh, and finding myself in, with that hat on as IUCN, I thought this is a good time to also attend as an international organization. So I've attended as a national NGO, international NGO, range state, and in, in, intergovernmental organization. So I've, I've really, I think, uh, yes, straddled the entire field. Uh, and and it's been a it's been a it's been a wonderful thing. I mean, Vinny talked about elephants, and I was also involved in elephants. I still am in terms of IUCN. I'm chairing the Elephant Specialist Group for Asia. Uh, but it's not just elephants. I mean, in fact, uh, the the first report of ours which made it to CITES was on rhino on rhino horn, uh, something that I had authored in ninety one on on the on the state of the uh, Greater One Horn Rhinoceros. Very soon, I was pulled into something, uh, Doctor. Uh, Zhu, you may remember, uh, was Shatush uh, with the whole uh, Tibetan antelope uh, issues. And we worked very closely with China at that stage uh, because the animal there was in China, the demand was in India, and we, we worked in both uh, you know, uh, uh, scenarios to ensure that that uh, did not endanger the Tibetan antelope. Uh, you cannot be an Indian without dealing with tigers. So for a long time, I was also involved in the entire uh, tiger discussions uh, in CITES and there, thereby 
even within the Indian delegation, having several discussions with the Chinese delegation, uh, which Dr. Zhu is familiar with. Um, but interestingly, there, there are many other things uh, I, I, I would like to say, which is that uh, when, when I started going into societies, advising the government, there was suspicion of civil society. So Will Travers talked about it in a different way. But I was actually part of the Indian delegation. And I remember the very first meeting at the Standing Committee, actually there was a protest lodged that there is a civil society person in the delegation. <laughs> and my ambassador had to clarify that, you know, that I was a member of the Indian delegation as, as a technical advisor. Uh, so th there was suspicion that anybody who was not, did not have a government job had an agenda. But that is not the case in, 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 in the developing world, which is that there was no capacity in the government. And the technical skills came from outside, uh, which is not the case now. Now the governments have really got a number of uh, people in, 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 in India, for example, to deal with uh, such issues. But in those early days, they depended on some of us uh, over the years to provide the technical input into both proposals that India wanted to put forward but even more importantly, on global proposals, because 